Anyway, notwithstanding all that, I should move on to more, more uh, hot cultural method um, measures for tonight. And it's going to be, um, we are going to welcome tonight Chris Ride, who is, I have to say this, he's, he's the Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger. <laughs> oh, 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 the lane, he's the only one. That's why he's Lone Ranger. And he has no, he has no Tonto, and he has no. no um, none, of, none of that. I'm sorry if that's spoiled any of your thunder. But he, he does look after our, our Landguard, Landguard Common. Um, tells me it's not the biggest in the country. It's common, I mean. And um, I'm sure he'll regale us with the whole um, story about the nature reserve down there. So I think I'll try and sit down now before I get myself in trouble. And welcome, Chris. And All right. Oh, thank you very much. On we go. Two years this September, so still very much a new boy, but it goes in two year contracts. Um, luckily enough, I've just been signed up for another two years, so <laughs> I'll be around for a little bit longer. Um, I wasn't always in this kind of work, I did 18 years in agriculture and ended up um, specialising in outdoor pigs, or sort of 18 years doing that. Um, uh, so yeah, this was the side. I went back to college in 1996 and studied for a countryside diploma and, and have been a ranger ever since, so I never looked back, so there you go. Um, that's me <laughs> as a younger man. <laughs> uh, my agricultural career enabled me to fill my passion of travelling and I'm in uh, Kashmir in northern India and I've just caught my supper. Um, I don't look too well though, I didn't really big dysentery. You shouldn't drink the water! Yeah, no, I uh, shouldn't swim in it. And yeah, and eventually, oh, no, after, I got to stay in remote locations. That's a, a, a Buddhist monastery in about 15,000 foot up in the Himalayas. But as I was going to say, life catches up with horses. The boy I was in. And eventually, I met my wife and had two children. So we're used to Windy Coast. <laughs> right, getting to the nature reserve, that's the um, northern half of it, the bit that's actually protected by a sea wall. And you can see the, the, the line of the, uh, what are called the rifle butts, the sort of raised areas closer to the sea. They, they're actually um, man-made pumps to uh, soak up stray bullets when they did their uh, firing practice against the targets. Of the, um, rougher grass on this end of the nature reserve. Um, there's more people and more dogs, so less rabbits basically, and the rabbits are the chief managers of the nature reserve. There's a little sort of fenced off area where there's a pond um, up against the road, viewpoint road. Um, and once the, sort of the whole port area would have been a sort of, almost like a sort of a delta system, there's a Walton Creek that used to yeah. flow through there and other sort of little watercourses. So it's a naturally wet area, so all they had to do is dig out a pond and it, and it filled up. It's not, not lined or anything like that. Um, Manor Terrace car park there, when that was put in and, and the borders were dug to put the um, sort of edging in, lots of stinking goose foot came up. I don't know if anyone's heard of this plant that grows uh, on the nature reserve. It's, it's, it's one of the rarest plants in the UK. Um, I'll show you a picture a little later on. <clears throat> this is the, the, what's known as the point. This is the southern half of the reserve, and the, the, the part that's not um, protected by a sea wall on that side anyway. Mm -hmm. Up on the curb, there's a sea wall just to prevent the erosion, really. Mm -hmm. um, up by the white radar tower, you can see a group of little buildings before it. That's the Rangers bungalow. Um, that was built by a Victorian entrepreneur who built lots of railway bridges and stuff like this. And he built that bungalow out of engineering bricks and it still looks pretty pristine even today, you know, because they last a long time. It's also double skinned. It's got a, a cavity wall, which was well before its time, you know. Uh, so it's quite snug in the winter. Anyway, getting back to the winter. <laughs> um, you see, uh, right, up the, right up at the point uh, is, is the um, structure that was built to stop the shingle from uh, drifting, the longshore drift, taking it and blocking, blocking off the shipping lane. That's, that's why they did it. Um, and since they built that, 22 acres of shingle have built up. 
and created, you know, what you can see there now. Uh, that was from 1875 to 1914, in fact, it took to build up 22 acres of shingle. In places, it's about 15 metres deep. That's on the edge there, where they see that black fence, that's taken out now, but that still belongs to Harwich Harbour Authority. They retain the ownership all the way around to the point. That's the aggregate yard that used to be behind the bungalow, just in front of the fort there. Quite an old picture. And that, that's the sort of entrance that you go in through the back gates opposite the, the fort. Um, I had that sign made up the first year that I was a ranger there because, uh, you know, one of the sort of key things is keeping dogs uh, under control and things like that. And a lot of people said your, your signs aren't up to much. And so that's, that's made of recycled plastic. That sort of gets the message across and the fact that you are entering a nature reserve, which some people didn't seem to, to realise. Also, uh, dog walking zones was another one. They, then they said, you know, you know, where can I walk my dog? It's not very clear. So I've got these signs made up, so that makes it quite clear. But, you know, dogs aren't the only threat. And uh, bottle goes on top of the fence post because you put a, a, a fence line around the shingle to protect the uh, ring plovers, but you've also given gulls and crows a nice perching viewpoint to see see their prey a bit better. So you put that on, they can't per perch on it. So that's a bit of bad weather up at the point, but that was only last summer. You know, that, that's, a, that's a baby. That was a summer storm, yeah. The one that actually happened in uh, um, last year. Washed up. The sea came in, and that's the tide line. That's how close it got to the back of the bungalow, back of my car. And that that tide line there that you can see going off into the distance is it, it's where it's raised all the rabbit droppings off the grass <laughs> to deposit them in the line. So there's there actually some good plants that came up along there. <laughs> Added a bit of fertilizer. Yeah. Did you um, I don't think any of them did. I, th I think it came in so gradually they would have legged it to, get out. to other places. Yeah. Uh -huh. But that's that's it in relation to the you know the bungalow. Uh, the garages which were just on from it, the lower one had about sort of 12 inches of seawater in it. Um, that night, um, it, it, I think it happened at about half past one in the morning, and I knew when the you know the storm surge was going to happen and the, the environment agency you know let you know if there's a, a particular warning rather than just a flood alert um, and they advise you to get out and so we headed off up to to lower stuff and got flooded there instead which is, <laughs> <laughs> at least it wasn't half past one in the morning <laughs> so this is your coastal oh sorry go back again Coastal vegetated shingle is what gives it really its uh, triple SI status, its special, special scientific interest, because it is such a rare habitat. Um, and you can see there that uh, you know, East Anglia's got one of the main concentrations, and it's defined by being from 2 millimetres to 200 millimetres. Less than 2 millimetres, it's classed as sand. Above 200 millimetres, it's classed as a boulder. So <laughs> that's how they class it. And globally restricted uh, sediment to the city, Northwest Europe, Japan, and New Zealand. You know, there's not much elsewhere. You get quite a lot in Suffolk, and that's why people sort of take it for granted, perhaps, because you're used to seeing it. But it's actually a, quite a rare habitat. And it's largely made up of sea kale, but in between it, lots of other different plants, and you can see a few of the yellow horn poppies just starting to flower there, it's probably late May or June. The other main habitat on the reserve is, is classed as lowland acid gra uh, grassland, and uh, the soil on the southern half reserve, it overlies the shingles, gives it a specific nature. Um, it's unimproved part of it means it hasn't received fertilisers or been ploughed. Um, you know, which is 
relatively rare habitat in the UK now. You can see one of the most important concentrations is in the Suffolk Sandlings. And then the population's extensive areas of acid grassland are included within sites designated as common land. I mean, that's really the reason they were designated as common land in the, in the first place, because they're too difficult to be brought into agricultural production. You know, it's wasteland. Mm -hmm. And then, so therefore, it gets the classification of common land. There's the pasture up towards the point. And uh, take, have to keep the brambles from spreading too much. Um, but really, the, one of the chief managers is this chap, <laughs> just taking an afternoon off there. <laughs> but um, they can get too, too many, um, and if they start to overgraze over the site, which I believe they are doing in places, then uh, you really have to control them, and uh, I think that's what it needs doing there. Because the last time they were controlled was in 1999, when Suffolk Wildlife Trust uh, managed the site. This is a young sea cow, looks a bit like purple, purple grass, sprouting broccoli, I suppose you know. Mm -hmm. And that's it in, in flower. Mm -hmm. and one of these plants, uh, you know, it can be a number of years old. Yeah, it's, it's gone to seed, and these seeds, I believe, can float in the seed for a number of weeks, months. Uh, and still be able to germinate, so it's one of its adaptations to <coughs> spreading further afield. A bit of sea holly, um, yeah. when I first went to, to work on the reserve, I was told that it grew in one place down by Mammy Terrace Car Park. That bit came up in the other half of the reserve last year. Oh. And then I was sort of keeping an eye on it, and then the rabbits just nibbled all the um, seed heads off. Oh. <laughs> but at first I thought someone had cut them off for their decoration. <laughs> you know, this is but um, since then I found out the sea holly that's just been nibbled off by rabbits. So I don't know that's why, why they find it. That's the other end, I suppose. Mm. Near the car park. Yeah, yeah this is where right. the dogs are. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So. Mm. Another reason to. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, CP, um, very sort of pea like looking plant with flowers. Um, it, it's edible, but it, there is a toxin within it which um, does not poison you straight off. It can build up in your system and apparently paralyze you from your waist down. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Having said that, um, people in the Middle Ages, uh, during the famines in the Middle Ages along the Suffolk coast, actually uh, survived the famines by eating the kale and the sea peas. Um, <coughs> it's sort of documented evidence. So. And that's right up at the point, and I put that enclosure of post and rope around it because it's very vulnerable to trampling, and it was starting to sort of disappear a bit. Even though there's the plastic boardwalk there, you know, a lot of people still want to sort of take a shortcut, and it, it really doesn't take much trampling to, to make it disappear, so, you know, it's easy to go back. That's a one plant of sea rocket on the whole reserve I found last year. It just came across it. Quite a small thing, but, you know, it can grow quite big. And, yeah, just the one. Mm. But you can see the succulent type leaves, you know, it's yeah. one of the adaptations of all these plants yeah. to survive the harsh conditions, drying out and so mm. forth. Is that edible? Um, I don't know, I don't know, actually. It may well be, I'm not sure. Mm. No. This I know this one is when it's in its sort of younger state, before it starts to get prickly, it's a bit, I taste it, it's a bit like samphire. <laughs> but it's few and far between. <laughs> and it's one of, one of these plants they call, the, you know, the ephemeral plants that grow along the actual tide line. And you can quite oh, yeah. often below a four metre tide line mark. So, um, consequently, they, they get trampled quite easily along there because people tend to sort of walk along that edge and that's another one that grows in the same place. That's actually... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Not CB, no? Uh, C mm. sandwort wort. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Okay, I said all right, and then I heard someone say all right, so I switched on. But you can see the frosted leaves, and that's another adaptation of a lot of these plants that grow by the sea. They, they have this kind of sort of powdery, frosty covering which stops them drying out. Lovely. Raised knot plants. That's <laughs> there is one called uh, sea knot grass, which is much rarer, but you know, quite quite alike. You see the little flowers that just grow oh, out from know. near the leaves, and that's it. So uh, visitors to the nature reserve, of course, bird watchers. Um, and particularly bird watchers with, with cameras, uh, um, you know, can be just as much a nuisance with someone with a dog off a leaf, to be honest, sometimes. <laughs> because, you know, quite often in the pursuit of getting a, a really good uh, photograph, uh, they want to get closer to get that sharp image, and so the bird will be put up and so it flies off to another location when it actually is migrating, it should be resting and feeding. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a <laughs> well, spade, spade is what I say. It's just disturbing wildlife. You know, I'm not going to pull any punches. This is a Suffolk Walking Festival, and I did three walks entitled uh, A Point to My Ramblings. <laughs> Might be more true than not. And uh, it's with Scouts who help out with a beach box clean every September and actually log all the stuff for the Marine Conservation Society. Oh gosh. Every single cigarette butt gets counted. <laughs> uh, that's a new set of steps we put in first winter I worked. Mm. Uh, just because they tend to get eroded around the sides and start falling apart. Is that, Michael, the that? that is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there he is again. Oh, yeah. And that's after that storm surge. The sea came over at that point as well and lifted up the boardwalk and floated it about and so it's all crooked. Still a bit wonky to this day actually. Um, that's a guy doing his um, Duke of Edinburgh Gold Award and so he's tidying up inside the entrance of the gate. And that's a guy called John. He, he, he comes into Langard every, every morning practically and uh, he's a retired bin man but he oh, he, he likes to get up early and go into oh, picking oh. on the point and you know people told me about this guy and I said look you know I've got to log your bon as you volunteer out and he said oh no I don't want to be any to do anything to do with that you know mm -hmm. and I can understand he didn't want to be sort of held to account or you know any red tape so <laughs> he just comes in and does it. Oh, lovely. And he's found all sorts of things, you know, scaffolding planks arrived in the garden and he's got three oars. I <laughs> said, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, one now is a boat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is a guy called Laurie from Mosley. He's been helping me this summer um, uh, survey the flora. Uh, he's a great botanist, so I've learned quite a lot from him. Because you know, many of these plants are uh, unfamiliar to me, because so I come from uh, South Buckinghamshire in the Chiltern, so I'm more <laughs> chalk parson man, really. And here's what can happen to the paths they can get choked up with bramble. So I persuaded uh, the project officer down there to buy me a, a brush cutter, which can do that, which I can. yeah. <laughs> No messing, you don't do it with loppers just snipping off the ends, you knock it back. <laughs> and school visits, this uh, was one organised by Suffolk Wildlife Trust, uh, with, uh, Coastal Champions. It was a mixture of uh, primary schools in Felixstowe, learning about different aspects of the coast. Oh. And, and these are four ring cover eggs, and uh, that's one of my sort of almost measurable tasks, it seems, down there, is to improve the breeding success of the, the ring plovers who nest, as you see, directly on the shingle. There it has the ring plover in, in, in more ways than one, because you see, it's been trapped and ringed. 
I just noticed earlier he's standing next to a cigarette butt. That's <laughs> 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 one from Scout. That one wasn't found. Yeah. 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 Uh, very difficult to get the photo of the chicks, you know, oh, distant. That? And that one had four, and I think three of them got predated this year. That was oh. earlier in June. Oh, yeah. There's another one. And, you know, that's just a couple of days old, three days old, and you just wonder how those legs fitted into the egg, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's one I called Little Emperor because um, after the, the Chinese uh, one child policy, they, they call all their children <laughs> Little Emperor. <laughs> so I guess he was spoiled, but he survived, you know. And he actually fled the next day. In, in ring plover terms, that means he, he flew, you know, rather than. They leave the nest after 24 hours. As soon as they dry off, they, they're out of the nest because it's more danger to stay, stay put. Um, and that's a, a, a display that I recently, last week, put into the um, visitor centre, come camp <coughs> down there. Um, and it's just a sort of trying to do a mock-up of a, a ring plover nest. Um, and those are replica eggs, believe it, believe it or not. I think the, the word replica is slight misuse. <laughs> it's a lot, lot more yellow than a normal ring plover egg, but yeah. they get away with it by saying, oh, there's a lot of variation in eggs, but I've, <laughs> I've never seen yellow. <laughs> and there's a better shot. So the breeding success or not, it says uh, pre-2014, one fledged chick in five years, and I'm, I'm sort of, you know, blowing my own trumpet here, uh, but 2014, there are three pairs of ring plovers, married seven fledged chicks, but that was mostly due to luck, due to the local kestrel not being around. And uh, I found out that it, the kestrel had its head bitten off by the local peregrine. Who oh. <laughs> um, ate his head, oh. as birds often do, because the brain is quite a nutritious part to, to eat, and they, they seem to know it. Um, anyway, he took the kestrel out for me. <laughs> we had no predations by kestrels last year, but this year we have, so we've had, you know, six chicks were predated by the kestrel, uh, we had one infertile egg, and, but most of them were, the eggs were egg predations, um, you know, by gulls and crows. Um, I have noticed when people fish along that shore, they, they do attract gulls, um, uh, some people bury their bait and things like that, and um, yeah, if you leave a buried squid, not long before the girls can smell it and get it out. Um, so yeah, maybe another sort of issue. Flora observed said in excess of 500 species of vascular and graminae species. Um, so it's, yeah, you know, graminae, uh, the, the grasses, uh, a lot of grasses. And apparently it's got including a, wood, a woody uh, flea bane, but I haven't found the <coughs> flea bane. But I have found the uh, stinking goose foot. Uh, we found six, I found six plants last year. A chap from the bird observatory found three plants this year. Um, what are bryophytes? Bryophytes, they're sort of um, in between a lichen and a moss almost, you know, they're kind of hard to describe them really, you know, I have never really gone into them. Before. But you've got 27 types. <laughs> yeah, but this is a, a takeout from the management plan, you know, and uh, oh, pe people who have come along and um, surveyed for the lichens are, are kind of specialists in their subject. Um, so. And so what does vascular? I think vascular sort of means, is a, is a, is a general word for, for plants. Yeah. Um, which include grasses. Um, well, graminae, I think, means grasses. Yeah, so that separates out of the story. I suppose vascular covers the lichens, the bryophytes, and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a big patch of marrow grass down where the two halves of nature reserve meet. Um, you notice know, there's a lot of sand there. Um, this sand uh, has come from further up the coast where beaches have been loaded up with sand and then 
as what happens with the pace line in Suffolk, you get longshore drift and it tends to take stuff off and move it further south. So, um, unfortunately, it, it's covering over in, in places the uh, rare vegetated coastal shingle habitat. So, it's not, not, uh, not a good thing to happen, but you know, a little bit of a dune system, you know, for biodiversity, it might actually work. Um, I'm not sure why people want to cover up their shingle beaches with sand. They don't do it in Brighton. This is a very good shingle beach. Ones were on the nature reserve. Um, <coughs> most of it yes. is perforated, St John's work. If you hold it up to the light, you'll see uh, there's little sort of areas where you can see the light through. Not exactly holes, but where, the, where it's a lot thinner. And you know, in the days of herbal medicine, they started using it because they saw it as a thing for healing wounds, <coughs> if nothing else. But uh, I think they do use it. St John's work for antidepressants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice mm -hmm. one for uh, Scarlet Pimpernel. Well, yeah. Get lots of that. Mm -hmm. And that's me getting a bit arty with the. <laughs> yeah. And in the sward up towards the point, he's got this glass called Bearded Fescue. From this picture, you can see it, the grass in between the yeah. scar pimper now is bearded fescue. That just shows it, how it can grow if it's not cropped off by rabbits. Mm. Eggs and bacon, or yeah. <laughs> birds put to boil. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a wild pear tree, which is somewhere opposite the pond on the other oh, northern half. And goodness knows how it got there. Um, European wide, it, it's, a, it's a, an exact species of tree, but when they DNA the examples that exist in this country, it's slightly different. So it's not the wild pear tree, but a slightly modified one, which may have been brought over by the Romans, but they've already started playing about crossing it with other things. Another plant that was brought over by the Romans, uh, Alexander's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we can see how, you know, it, it must swamp out other plants, which it does. It's been a very good year for life as bee this year. Yeah, it's not very pretty colour. Yeah. And that yellow flower, I think, is, is a stone crop. I'm not sure which one. Hembane. Um, ever since I found out it's quite poisonous, it just looks sinister. Yes. <laughs> it just looks lazy. I think Dr. Crippen uh, used the poison, didn't he, from Hempane to do in several people. Oh dear. A plant called Common Stalks Bill. Peppers the pasture in the um, southern half. You can see the stalks bills just down at the bottom there where it's gone, gone to seed. You get this thinking gooseberry. Oh, you can say. I found this by doing a flora survey last year. Went down by Manor Terrace Car Park and um, yeah, it's a strange plant, you know, I've been on the lookout for it and when I actually found it, ah, you know, <laughs> found one at last. Never seen that. Um, and you find out exactly if it is one by rubbing it between your fingers. Yeah, so does it actually stink? It's a stench, yeah, oh. a rotting fish. Oh! oh. And uh, you wash your hand. Once in a blue moon is, is a subalpine warbler. I think that, yeah, judging by the, the name at the bottom was 2013. Uh, arrived on the reserve. Is it a very small bird? This one, yes, it is, yeah. Sort of, well, probably in size, I think. Yeah. And lots of wheat ears um, come along in the spring, and they, they're on the reserve for quite a while because not all of them are going up to North England to nest, as you know, some do. Not many nest in the south or the Midlands. Um, but quite a lot of them are going up to sort of high Arctic regions to, to nest. So they're not in any hurry. They know that if they get up there too early, it's going to be too cold to get on and do anything. So they, they hang around for a bit. They don't actually breed on the preserve? Uh, no, I don't think they ever have, but it's, a, it's possible that they could. Yeah, especially if there was an empty uh, rabbit burrow, which there isn't very often. <laughs> There's a lot of rabbits. 
that's a member of the Woodpecker family. I'm not, I'm not too sure where it hails from, or, but it does come here to, to breed as well. This is Greenish Warbler, very much a passage migrant. That's a migrant who's not coming to this country to nest. My fuller fuller bird will really be on out towards the um, main entrance uh, rubbish bin. And uh, as I was going by, sort of reasonably early in the morning, I heard the voice shout down from the bird observatory. It's a greenish warbler, you know. And yeah, I thought, ah, yeah, all right, I'm not going to fall for this one. You know. It's just like I say, you know, go to the shop and need some uh, striped paint or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But I thought, well, I'll play this call. And I like, yeah. and this. Anyway, went underneath the whole notes, and I thought, this is just going to be a silhouette that I'm going to see here. But the light came through the trees, and I could see this, this bird. And in fact, it was, you know, visibly different than a chip chap or willow warbler yeah. and a hundred other greenish warblers. Yeah. <laughs> so I take that one off. I'm, I'm not a twitcher. <laughs> but this was alongside the con concrete track going up to the point, just amongst some brambles, very loose brambles, and there, there are four meadow pipits in that nest. You see the, one of the beaks is at the back. Um, it actually managed to get those fledged, so I was very happy about that. Most of the meadow pipits will go up north to the morning, it's quite slow, so I could just bend down and pick him up. So I placed him on this rock and again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Pose> again. <laughs> That's actually in the garden. You just see the fence, it gives it away. <laughs> and I was talking about sand inundation before, and, and this, this is what happens. Um, yeah, it's come down the longshore drift in a winter storm and whoosh. Most of the gear is very thick. And uh, I think they're what you would call, oh, I'm not sure, that might be adnate gills. You do the gills that are free from the stem, so they just turn them as free. And this funny little thing um, from a group called the stomach fungi, uh, puffballs, but most of them you can eat. This thing is so small you wouldn't want to bother with it. But I'd never seen one before I came to Langard because they are a coastal, particularly a coastal variety. You don't you don't find them in land. I was surprised to find the wood blew it, you know, if yeah. you normally find them in, in woods, yeah. <laughs> on the edge of woods, but uh, nonetheless, they're there. Um, insects, yeah, on the, on, on the ragwort, yeah. yeah. Um, because we're not near any agricultural land, there's no pressure to get rid of, the to get rid of them. And so we've got lots of lovely um, cinnabar moths mm. and their caterpillars. Mm. Clouded yellow is a bit of what I suppose, a butterfly that you quite often see passing through. And this, this one we saw last July, last year, and I was showing a, a, a respected volunteer around the reserve and we just had to check this buggy bush out to see some butterflies go in and I uh, had a good look at some and I said, oh crumbs, you know, quick, get your camera, you know, this is a uh, yeah. type of fritillary mm. and took a photo and then we found out it's, it's a high ground fritillary and this, the last one that was recorded in Suffolk was 1959, oh, wow. which was the year that I was born. But, uh, <laughs> So it's really special. Um, the Suffolk butterfly recorder guy reckoned it could be, it could be one that's come over from uh, Holland. I uh, don't know if you remember last year, there was a thing called a scarce tortoiseshell that was showing up on this coast. Uh, it's, it's like a tortoiseshell, but bigger and with yellow legs. Anyway, they came across some favourable winds, and I think this did as well. Was a, there was an onshore wind for about four days solid, you know. Um, but he said that you can actually buy the chrysalis on, online oh. <laughs> and cast them out and oh. uh, so, but I don't know. I think I'll go for the wind. <laughs> this is Nigel Oden and a guy called Eric who's in the green shirt painted down and I uh, met them up at the point the other day. They had a tea bag and I thought they were going to accost some angler to get them to brew, brew them up a bruise or thing. And they said, no, it's full of pheromones, you know. I thought, oh well, 
Maybe imagine sort of dabbing it behind the ears. <laughs> and there's a notice for this uh, particular moth. Uh, the food plant of the moth is the um, vertebrate trefoil. And they place, place the tea bag on the vertebrate trefoil, and, and within seconds, these moths came out. They're very small, they're not, not much to, to see. That's a tiny little thing. There's a six belty clearly. Yeah. A nationally scare moth, scare small. Oh, yeah. Along the beach, you often find the odd things. Mm -hmm. My daughter picked this up, and I thought, oh, she picked up a marble or something, and mm -hmm. handed it to me. It was all soft and clear. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, uh, you know, it's a sort of type of jellyfish, but it's a, it's akin to a jellyfish. It's a um, uh, called a, uh, a jelly cone, which is a oh. relation. That's, fine. Uh, that's uh, the kind of sunset you get across the Harrow skyline almost every evening when the clouds are there. And I watch the sun come bobbing along the skyline. And when it gets to behind St Nick's Church, you know, the weather's going to warm up. And when it goes back, you know, it's going to start getting cold. <laughs> that's one over the fort. And that's Mr Clement Chung. Uh, uh, senior executive, what they call a CEO? What's that stand for? Chief executive Chief officer, that's right. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be a good idea to invite him to come and have a look at the, the nature reserve, and he agreed. And I thought, well, you know, since money from the port has come to the yeah. nature reserve indirectly through what they call Section 106 money, that when the port uh, uh, extends, it has to give money to the local authority, and then they have to give it, you know, to worthy causes in the community. Anyway, so I thought, you know, you should come and have a look. And when I asked him if he'd ever been here before, he said, no, so that yeah, was good. You know, so he actually managed to spot a ring plug sitting on his neck, so I was quite, quite impressed. You know, so most people said, well, where is it? <laughs> and as we were passing the bungalow, my wife came out for a quick chat because she's Chinese and to speak some Mandarin with him. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and if you're in any oh, wonder where the, the pot of gold is, in the last half there. That's where the pot of gold is. And that's it, thank you. Oh.